Uh, good morning, everyone. I know a, a room full of historians, and I'm not walking up to the stage with a whole stack of papers. Some are typed, some are handwritten, notes in the margin, that sort of thing. Uh, you're thinking, wow, this is going to be short and unusual for a hist Wait a second. Wait, I have that. Wait. <clears throat> I'm so, so sorry. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to welcome you to the University of Houston downtown. I'm told that this is the uh, first time that this symposium has been held on campus. Uh, and we're so glad you're here, and I hope that you find uh, the day uh, fantastic and that you'd be uh, interested in coming back and visiting us uh, someday in the future. So here are my remarks. <clears throat> Ready? I got a written speech. Good morning. Uh, University of Houston downtown is happy to welcome everyone to the uh, 2019 San Jacinto Symposium. Uh, this year's theme, Women in the Texas Revolution, is important and timely, and it looks like uh, there is a really fine program in store for everyone today. Let me say how sorry I am, uh, building on what Frank was just saying, that the chemical plant has caused the battlefield tour to be uh, postponed, uh, but I suppose breathing in benzene for several hours on a Saturday is probably not a good idea. I want to thank everyone involved in putting this event together. I especially want to recognize Dr. Frank de la Teja, CEO of the Texas State Historical Association, and of course, uh, Dr. Jim Crisp. My goal today is to stay up here long enough to get heckled by Professor Crisp. So that's, <laughs> so get ready, we'll see. <clears throat> I also want to recognize uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Jean Preuss, uh, and all of the staff uh, who are here to, uh, today to help put on this event. 183 years ago, on April 21st, 1836, General Santa Anna, the self-styled Napoleon of the West, surrendered to a ragtag group of Texans and Tejanos led by General Sam Houston, and Texas claimed independence. Four months later, two land speculators, Augustus and John, the Allen brothers, bought 6,600 acres of land off of the Buffalo Bayou and established a town site just across the bayou from us and named it after General Houston. Francis Lubbock, later governor of Texas, recalled the first time he saw Houston. He and a group of settlers spent three days coming up on a steamer from Harrisburg when they got to the White Oak Bayou, they realized they had passed the city. Uh-huh. That was possible in those days. <clears throat> Probably not possible now. Lubbock wrote, here we go. I don't know how Lubbock spoke, but I'm going to interpret how I think Lubbock would have spoken. We then backed down the bayou and by close observation discovered a road or street laid off from the water's edge. Upon landing, we found stakes and footprints indicating that we were in the town tract. This was about the 1st of January, 1837, when I discovered Houston. For though I did not accompany Columbus when he discovered America, as is asserted, I certainly was at the discovery of Houston. <laughs> Actually, if you go out the south deck, which would be kind of that way, um, and you look across the Buffalo Bayou, you can see Allen's Landing, and almost 17 miles as the crow flies from where we're sitting right now is a San Jacinto battleground. I doubt Lubbock or the Allen brothers could have imagined in 1836 what Houston and Texas would become in 2019, the fourth largest city in the US. We're gonna pass Chicago any day now, right? Am I right? Uh, I've been advocating for, I, this is a complete tangent, and uh, maybe this will get me heckled by uh, Professor Crisp, but I've been arguing that we need like downtown, some, like a ticker tape thing that just like counts down like the population, and then there needs to be like some fireworks or something when we finally uh, show uh, Chicago what we're made of. All right, uh, so we are the fourth largest city of the U.S. temporarily. Uh, we are certainly one of the most diverse, and according to the signs coming out of the airport, we are the most diverse city. Now, I should stop here, and you would be appreciative of that, and allow each of you to marvel at the depth of my historical knowledge. Uh, the truth is that I hadn't even heard that there was such a thing as the Battle of San Jacinto until a few weeks ago. 
Uh, I've actually only been a pro I'm going to confess this. I'm in the confessional booth now. I've been a proud Texan for all of three months. Um, I, I know, right? So I grew up in Boston. Surprisingly, we don't have courses in Texas history in uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Most of what I know about Texas as an American lit scholar comes from reading Cormac McCarthy novels. So <clears throat> I need this conference, right? Uh, all the credit for anything I've said intelligent about Texas history today actually goes to uh, Dr. Preuss, uh, who gave me a few notes and helped me not make a fool of myself. <clears throat> we are pleased uh, to host so many historians and others who share a love of history. Texas history is an important part of our curriculum here at the University of Houston downtown, and many history majors will become part of the area workforce as teachers, college professors, and business leaders with a deep interest in the region's history. Students in the University of Houston downtown's Webb Historical Society have participated in a variety of historical projects, including working to preserve local history, collaborating with other organizations and community partners, and giving our students the opportunity to explore this state's rich history. In 2015, the UHD chapter was named the Garner Christian Chapter to honor his 50 years of, of service teaching, of service teaching Texas history. Garner started at UHD, the, the UHD Web Chapter in 1975, making it the second oldest chapter in the state. It has earned the Outstanding University Chapter Award from the TSHA several times. The current faculty advisors are Dr. Jean Preuss, Dr. Mary Nicholson Preuss, and Dr. Jose Alvarez. Uh, once again, on behalf of the University of Houston downtown, I welcome you to campus and hope you have a great symposium. And unfortunately, I guess I have to get my car out of the president's spot. <laughs> so uh, I wish you all a great day. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Frank. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'd like to tell uh, Dr. Link for, for just a second as, as he steps out of the room that, that um, I, I got here a little bit earlier, back in 1981, but, but, I'm, but I'm from Jersey. So, so you can, there's hope for you. All right. Yeah, there you go. There's, <laughs> thank you. Um, and so I am, uh, I'm sorry, I was a little remiss. I, uh, I neglected to mention one of our major sponsors. This today's conference could not be possible without a uh, grant from the George Strake Foundation. The George Strake Foundation is here in, in Houston and they have been very generous to us. So um, they, are, uh, they are a major sponsor right behind the, the university. Um, so, um, without further ado, I would like to say that uh, one of our presenters, uh, Bruce Winders, uh, cannot be with us today, and, uh, but his, his paper is here, so you, you will get my uh, dulcet tones later on as I, as I read his, his paper to you. Uh, for the moment, I would like to introduce our moderator, uh, Jim Crisp, and, and I won't repeat what's in the program. Uh, I, I'd just like to add a little to it. Um, he's been a good friend of the San Jacinto Symposium from the very beginning. Uh, he's here for the 17th or the 18th, ninth, but I mean as a moderator. 17th. 17th, see, 17th time as the moderator. Um, and so uh, both the Conservancy and, and the association are very thankful that uh, he's come out of retirement to step up to it one more time. Uh, he's also a very good friend of mine. He's retired from the uh, uh, North Carolina State University, uh, but continues to engage in Texas uh, history research. His long-awaited book-length analysis of Herman Ehrenberg and his narrative of the revolution is nearing completion, finally. <laughs> so keep an eye out for it. I also have, um, I can also say that a couple of years ago, the Conservancy named him a hero of San Jacinto, so he has that distinction as well. And therefore, I, uh, with no further ado, I turn the program over to him. Is this the table? Yes, yep. I shouldn't take time to say this, but when our basketball team from Henrietta, Texas went to Austin for the state finals, 
when I was a senior, we decided since they won the first game, we would tour Austin a bit, go see the Capitol. And it was very hard to find a parking place until we found one right in the very best place, <laughs> Governor Connolly's. <laughs> we didn't stay. Um, I want to thank those people who have kept me embroiled in the San Jacinto Symposia for actually, since the first one, 19 years. As uh, the provost uh, suggested, I am occasionally a heckler. And after being a speaker at the first, I was a heckler from the audience at the second. And so to prevent that from ever happening again, they made me moderator for life. <laughs> um, briefly, I want to say a few things this morning about what historians do. It'll only take about 30 or 40 minutes. <laughs> no, I want to say uh, what historians do, and it's not to recreate real life. We try, but we always fail to get to the real lives of the people who took part in those events of the past. Uh, the great John Lewis Gaddis, a Yale historian, uh, has a book uh, about how historians map the past. You know, we do maps, but if you've ever seen a map, you know it's not all there. You put what you want to emphasize, whether it's geologic formations if you're in the oil business, or whether it's bicycle trails around Houston, or highways so that you can get out of Lubbock, let's say. Um, I was once told by a Lubbock person that the most important street in town was the one that took you out. I have other Lubbock stories that I will not <laughs> mention today, although Texas Tech is in the semifinals for the basketball tournament. Um, historians uh, map the past, and they also paint the past. And if you're an aficionado of art, of painting, you know that often simply a simple line done by someone like a Picasso can bring you to reality more greatly than a very formal historical painting, which is often not really historical at all. It's just what the artist thought it ought to look like. And so as I thought about our topic for today, women in the Texas Revolution, um, my thoughts went to the person I've been working on for the last 27 years, this teenage German immigrant who was a relatively unknown member of the New Orleans Grays, who came to San Antonio at the beginning of the revolution, participated in the siege of Bayer and the taking of San Antonio, went down to Goliad, survived the Goliad massacre, and then like John C. Duvall and others, participated in the runaway scrape a little late as he followed the paths of the Texans who had left their homes behind as the Mexican army approached. And some of the houses he found had been totally cleaned out, sometimes by the Mexican army, sometimes the food was still on the table as the people left in a hurry. And what I've found as I've followed uh, this young man who was not 20 years old yet when he fought in the Texas Revolution is that by following a single obscure but not not unimportant individual. I've learned a great deal. Every one of his 34 chapters has taught me, as I've dived into it, more about the Texas Revolution than I knew in the past. And if we want to get close to real life, like how do you walk for five days across the Texas prairies without a way to make a fire and therefore eat? anything except raw plants and the occasional critter that you're willing to eat raw. Uh, lizards, for example. Um, as you follow these individuals who, whose names are not in our junior high history books, you will get closer to the real life of the Texas Revolution than you would by seeing a painting in the governor's mansion or reading a famous textbook, which has to hit the highlights but not get you down into the real nitty gritty. Um, and so the people who are going to be talking to you today 
are going to be taught, it's starting with Paula Mitchell Marks, who uh, has written uh, who, uh, about what happens to women when they find themselves on the Texas frontier. And specifically today, what happens to them when they are forced suddenly to leave their homes behind with no interstates and no hurricane route and rivers that have no easy way to cross and sick children and slaves either loyal or disloyal to the family and the men folk gone and many of them already did. Uh, this gets you to the real nitty gritty of what people are experiencing um, in the Texas Revolution. Um, so we paint the past, sometimes up close, sometimes at a distance. We map the past, emphasizing different phenomena in different maps. Uh, but in all cases, we're trying and never completely seeding, succeeding in getting real, in getting to the actual lives of the people who experienced Houston and Texas and the revolution uh, in full. They saw it in technicolor. They saw it up close. I once went to a theater that featured smell-o-vision. <laughs> you gotta be careful which movie you see when you're going to smell-o-vision. <laughs> but they could smell it, man. They could smell it, they could feel it, all of the five senses and maybe a sixth sense about when to leave your home were involved in this story that we're gonna to hear today by focusing on women in the Texas Revolution. I should mention a book, Women in the Texas Revolution, that one of our speakers, Mary Shear, edited a few years ago. It's got some wonderful artic articles, including one by one of our speakers, Jeff Dunn. But before we do anything else, I want to get Paula up here because you've heard enough of me. Uh, Paula is a UT PhD. She was in the American Studies program with the great Pulitzer Prize winner, William Gutzman, uh, whose students have informed me about so many things as I've tried to get into the lives of Texas. And um, she is a professor emerita I have to get the Latin right on that, since I've become Professor Emeritus um, at, from St. Edward's University in Austin. Uh, and she's going to get into that f multifaceted phenomenon, the runaway scrape. Paula? Thank you, Jim. You provided a lovely synopsis of my talk. <laughs> um, I also, in regard to parking issues, I just have to add that uh, having retired from St. Edward's, at St. Edward's our prayer was, Hail Mary, full of grace, help me find a parking place. <laughs> there is no question that the runaway scrape was tremendously significant in the lives of the women who lived it. And I have a couple of quotes in this regard, both from this wonderful book. Oh, he took, he took the book. <laughs> Women and the Texas Revolution. And you'll be hearing from Mary later, the editor, and she also has a, a great article in it as well. Um, but like Cummins wrote, the, the runaway scrape was for many women most of the, one of the most important events in their lives. And uh, Mary wrote, the revolution itself would become for women one of the most difficult and defining moments of their lives. I'm going to take this out so that I remember the 30 minutes. What I'd like to do today is look briefly at women's experiences in relation to the literature on displacement that we have today after all the major displacements of the 20th and now the 21st century, um, and then look at the nature of the runaway uh, of the uh, runaway scrape ex uh, experience and, um, and at the role of gender and briefly at the variation in women's experiences and, and the long-term effects. So that's where I'm going here. So first of all, I mean, what do we know about displacement in populations today? Well, I dipped into the literature and it is voluminous. Now, it's interesting, most of it actually refers to forced migration from a native land, all right? 
So that does not really apply here. Uh, because we have, well, of course, the first people to start moving are the Mexican population, for example, in San Antonio with Santa Ana's troops coming in and the families moving out to the ranches. So they were simply moving to a different location within their home region. And then most of the, the people who were actually fleeing through the subsequent weeks were um, primarily from the United States. So they were returning to a native land or a land that had been that they had been in before. So that does not really fit with some of the literature. A lot of this, the displacement literature too is about little or no hope of returning. And this may have seemed to be the case here, but for those who retur return, the period could be as short as a week or as long as a number of months. So there's that factor as well. So what does fit when we look at displacement uh, literature? Uh, well, the forced and the often chaotic nature of the migration in the face of warfare, the uncertainty dogging every step, the losses, human, cu cultural, economic, the consequences, those things, and, and, and people's physical and mental health as a result of having embarked upon this, this, this hurried journey. Uh, and it was hurried, even if they had prepared for it. And it was slow, of course, because even though it was hurried that you're sitting for a week waiting to cross one of the rivers, uh, it's, you're not going anywhere fast. So nowadays, they talk in terms of PTSD and depression as a result of some of these experiences. Um, specific triggers in the runaway scrape that, um, that speak to this. There's the stress and the uncertainty over success or failure of the revolution. There's the accompanying stress over military movements and also over the fate of fighting men and, or the knowledge of their deaths. I mean, I just keep thinking about the widows of Gonzales. So Sam Houston shows up, the Alamo has fallen, there are 32 men, according to the last source I read, have been killed. And now Sam Houston's going to burn the town <laughs> and take the families along with him on this eastward retreat. So talk about stress. Uh, we have it in, in their situation in particular. And I think it'd be really interesting to follow up as much as possible on, on the, all the Gonzalez widows. I, I did a little bit of that, and it, it looked uh, very fruitful. Um, the, another factor that fits well with displacement is the hurried removal, even if planned for, leaving behind the home environment that in the, these cases, usually among the more recent immigrants, had been so laboriously created just a few years before. Uh, and then we also have the destruction and the economic losses, the crops, property, homesteads, uh, the special mementos that had already helped people who were living in a remote area of Mexico to, uh, to survive and to maintain their ties. So with all of that in mind, let's look briefly at the nature of the runaway scrape itself. Uh, first of all, rumors, 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 rumors. And I know you, many of you are quite familiar with this, but if we look at it through the lens of a woman who has two kids and may or may not have her husband with her, but the men are probably be more likely to be out ranging and trying to figure out what's going on at various points and helping with the general evacuation. Um, these are things that are going to be part and parcel of a woman's life for uh, um, a period of time. Um, Ann Fagg and Teal remembered a horseman appearing and yelling, run, run for your lives. Mexicans and Indians are coming, burning and killing as they come. So they, I don't know if it would have helped to have Twitter or, or any of these modern communication methods. Maybe the rumors would have been even worse. Who knows? But the, the utter lack of immediate information by these people who are having to proceed so slowly and laboriously. Um, the chaos and crowding, by late March, the roads were filled to capacity, according to Light Cummins. Um, and with, that, with all the attendant uh, discomforts and delays and dangers, and you all are probably familiar with Rosa Kleberg's account, but she says the noise and the confusion were terrible at the Brazos crossing. Oh, these river crossings. I thought of that as I, we were driving down from 
Austin yesterday and just gliding over each bridge, over each river. Um, the widow Angelina Payton, and this is from Mary's article, um, said, great commotion, destruction of property, much left on the riverbanks, no wagons, scarcely few horses, many on foot, mud up to their knees, women and children. So it's a very stream of consciousness uh, 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 evocation of what they went through. And remember, they could take very little with them, and then to abandon some of it on a riverbank um, is another layer to look at. The slow halting progress and the dwindling resources indicated by having to leave things on the riverbank. Uh, and we go back, I just love to go back to Noah Smithwick. I just, I mean, I, I understand that his daughter may have, you know, had too much of a, of a role in, in engineering his memoirs, but, but just for, for, for sheer, um, engagement in ebulence, Noah Smithwick's account always, always satisfies. And uh, he does talk about encountering a young mother and her children slowly creaking eastward with the ungreased wagon wheels squeaking and smoking. Do any of you remember this? And an older daughter was walking alongside pouring water on the wheels and on the axle periodically. All right, so we have this young mother with kids and this slow, slow, slow progress in light of rumors and who knows what's going to happen next. Um, and he talks about how the sound stayed with him. So think about that, you know, that haunted him, that sound. Angelina Payton, who Mary refers to in her article, you know, well, I'm sorry, I've already mentioned that about what's being left on the riverbanks. And we have to remember here, I'll go ahead and get into the way in which this affected women perhaps in different ways. Because it was understood at the time, culturally understood, that women's domain was the home and they had responsibility for the home and the children to be torn from the home and from the objects of association that helped maintain that identity, helped support that identity. Um, is a factor here as well. John Holland Jenkins, in, in his memoir, talked about assisting in removing families from Bastrop right before Mexican troops arrived there. And he's, um, his mother was among those who were being removed. And he said those fleeing were waiting about waist deep in places, and one woman got stuck, and it took a lot of effort to get her out in the marshes um, um, outside um, uh, near the river. He says, it took a whole, us a whole day to traverse the Brazos Bottom, a distance of only four miles, okay? A whole day, four miles, with Indians and the Mexican army at your, <laughs> at your heels. <laughs> so uh, so the, the mental stress of that had to be pretty strong. Another aspect uh, or of the nature of the runaway scrape itself, the accidents, the sickness, the exhaustion, and the death. Now, of course, this varied, you know, and I'll talk about that soon, that, that there were you know, varying levels of what happened to people, but, but uh, according to Light, lost children were a real problem. So children fell off wagons, and they would be picked up by some other wagons. And there was one story of a baby that this traveling group was caring for because they found it, and they didn't know who it belonged to. And so it sounds as if, we don't know, though. I mean, how, many, how long did the reunion take? What added to a mother's stress to have, well, my child disappeared somewhere back there, and so we'll see if we are reunited or not. Um, we, we have um, went, uh, the quote from Kate Scurry Terrell, women sank by the roadside from exhaustion and many little children died. And you all are probably aware that Dilu Rose Harris's little sister died, that being such a famous account of, of the runaway scrape. Um, and and uh, even Emily Perry, who, who had a, a relatively um, less stressed removal, um, lost a child. Um, in everything that was happening in that time. I mean, died, the child died. After the runaway scrape, continued stress factors, whether and when to return, how much say that women had in that decision, 
what they would find, what would happen next. Uh, many families that remained in Louisiana regrouping, waiting for lawless, lawlessness in Texas to end uh, because there were looters who had gone in to deserted neighborhoods. Uh, many of them had missed the growing season, so it was a setback in food production. Rumors of a reinvasion and alliance between the Mexicans and the Comanches. And of course, as we all know, that, that those, those rumors had a reality to them. I mean, we go up to 1841 and we have another uh, case of the Mexican, uh, Mexican military coming in to uh, San Antonio. So, so do we go back or not? And who gets to make that decision? Because really, uh, women usually were not the decision makers. Now, we can talk about women's influence, but, but, and they certainly had to have the skills to go off and to live in a new environment. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they didn't have a lot of agency in that doctrine of separate spheres world where the men did all the public things and the women were identified with the private role. Uh, of course, when they return, as you all know, Angelina Payton, the place was bare of everything but ruins, all my things burnt up. Uh, Jeff has documented women trying unsuccessfully to get compensation for lost livestock, stored corn, buildings, etc. The most famous, of course, being Peggy McCormick, and, and his article is very good in that book as well. Um, enslaved women who returned having to go right to work in the fields and being on even slimmer rations than the, the, the people who, who are um, rebuilding with them. So what do, what, let's look more specifically at what role gender plays in displacement here. It's the one major revolution event that directly involved large numbers of women and children. Uh, second, the women were going to be less likely to have the most up-to-date information. They were going to be less mobile and generally less autonomous than the men, despite frontier adjustments in gender roles. Okay, so when I talk about the doctrine of separate spheres and women in the home place, obviously living in a remote region uh, of Mexico, women uh, and men worked out how things were going to get done. And men did tend to travel quite a bit, so women were left on the home place alone. So it's not as if women did not have survival skills, but, um, but they were relatively isolated in relation to the men. And the more I think about it, the more I think, I mean, there were some women who got to ride horses, at least part of this runaway scrape. But that was really more a male mode of transportation, at, at least at that point. And so if it's the difference between being able to move quickly on a horse wherever you need to go, or being consigned to a wagon with your children for, for what must have seemed an, seemed an endless period of time, even if we're talking about a week here, um, there's, it seems to be a gender difference there. Um, also, uh, the, the women who were part of this had already, I've been dancing around this, maybe I've said it, but they had already experienced difficult conditions. They had, um, many of them had set up homesteads in the previous you know, decade, decade and a half. Uh, and so had done all the hard work of, of uh, creating a place. Uh, and. And some of them did it with, uh, according to you know, one, one author, con the letters indicate a constant anxiety. I mean, they're, they're, the people who had immigrated in this, this immediately previous period had left homes behind. And if women were associated with the homes, well, then they had left a home. They had to create a home under difficult conditions, and then they had to leave that home. So all of that was in play. I know uh, my dissertation was on Samuel and Mary Maverick, and I somehow can't ever do a Texas history talk without bringing them into it. I've been traveling along with them for so long. But uh, when Mary Maverick uh, was brought to um, Texas from Alabama, from her home plantation in Alabama in 1838, the beginning of 1838, uh, she she said, uh, mother, so long to see my children. I mean, she, Mary had a bunch of children. She wound up having 10 children, although not all su survived to adulthood. 
but her diary is just full of, well, well, mother you know, so wants to see the children, but I don't know how we can arrange that. And they tried to make plans to go to the Texas coast and to meet her at the Texas coast. And, and of course, it never happened. I mean, her, her mother died. So, uh, so these, these separations that had already occurred, the hard work that had already occurred, and the anxiety accompanying all of that is, are part of the, the um, neurological makeup of some of these women at this point. Um, and then just the fact that they're pulled out of their domestic space where they are in charge as much as they can be into these, these mobile conditions. Um, and then experiencing the loss of children and husbands and security in a world that normally cut them off from agency besides finding ways to survive and endure at a pretty basic level. Um, I, I used to, when I was teaching, my students would, would occasionally say, oh, well, you know, they lost a kid, but people had a lot of kids back then so that they could have help with the farm and this and that and the other thing. And I, you, don't, you haven't read how people responded to the death of a child. Uh, it's, it's heartbreaking to read some of the things that people wrote after the death of a child. Yet, these women, in losing children, um, really had no time or space to mourn even, and I suppose that's a good in a way, but it would also have repercussions. Now, I do want to talk about the variations in women's experience as well. Geographic locations certainly made a difference, and I won't go into the ins and outs of it. As Mary says in her article, those in closest proximity to the front suffered the most. So. Uh, was it a hurried exit? Was it a relatively planned exit? Uh, how much time did one have to spend on the roadways? What mode of transportation did one have? Uh, there, where what, where it was the Mexican army at this point, or one of the at the uh, one of the units? Um, oh, class did make a difference. Anne Rainey Coleman uh, told the family slaves that they could take only one change of clothes with them. And she said, I will do the same. And the Mexican army, they had been told, was only seven miles from them. Uh, this is a quote. The Negroes were all in tears at the prospect of losing their all, which was felt by them as much as we felt our loss. Okay? So, but she cheated. <laughs> And maybe they did too. I don't know. It'd be, probably be a little bit harder. She put some immense, well, first she put her china in, but her husband caught her. So then she put some small mementos in. Um, but it did matter. Class did matter. I mean, Emily Scott Perry, and, and they moved simply to another plantation, to the plantation of friends. And, and they had, uh, as, as Mary pointed out in her article, access to wagons, livestock, and slaves to help with securing their farms, packing their belongings, and fleeing eastward. So they had resources that a lot of the others would not have. Ethnicity, of course, played a big role as well. Um, so enslaved women were less, less likely to able to choose what they would take. And they were unlikely to get the chance to ride in the carts or on horseback for at least part of the journey. And Diley Rose Harris mentions after an arduous river crossing, this is a quote, the women, sick children, and Negroes were left in the bottom without anything to eat. Um, the white women and children stayed in a wagon with a canvas cover, but the black women and their children stayed in carts, and the water came up in the carts. Uh, so we have the disparity there and then the disparity on return, too. And of course, everybody coming back, what's going to happen next? But, um, but African Americans and Mexican Americans are going to have a, or Mexican Texans, are going to have to navigate the growing hegemony of a republic defined by the, by the dominant group. Um, the effects were probably equally varied in terms of what happened to the women afterward. And I'm going to go back to Anne Rainey Thomas Coleman, who had instructed her slaves that they could only take one change of clothes. In her memoir, um, we learn a lot. She had had a pretty hard, hard, even though she was, she was a relatively privileged woman, she'd had a pretty hard time of it in Texas. But she had settled down with a husband and, and a child and, and uh, 
felt like life was coming together for her when the runaway scrape, when the revolution came and the runaway scrape occurred. And she and her husband and her child went to Louisiana. And her husband sold the Texas property. And Anne thought it was a ridiculously low price, but she did not have power to, to sway that decision uh, in a world in which if you were married, if, um, at least in, in Anglo law, uh, women were, were subs uh, uh, subservient to men in terms of financial decision making. Uh, so so they, they stayed in Louisiana and they never recovered economically. And they had a couple of other kids, but, but um, two of the children died, her husband died, Anne was left with debt. She was widowed with a young daughter and many debts. Uh, she had another marriage that didn't work out. She came back to Texas. But the rest of her life was really colored by the, the revolution and the runaway scrape because she never really got back to the promise that she had started to live at that point. And then there are the Gonzales widows. Uh, I think if we look at varied experiences, we have to look at them because in a way, I think when we think about trauma, theirs was probably off the charts. Records do indicate that some returned to Gonzales. Uh, and actually, there were already a number of widows in Texas. I read somewhere recently that uh, of the old 300 that by the time of the revolution there were 20 widow-headed households out of that group. So you had women who were already sticking whether they had men with them or not. Although as on other uh, areas that were, uh, were more remote, um, people tended to remarry fairly quickly too. I always think about um, uh, the, the newspaper in one gold mining town talking about the, the, the listing of the divorces and the marriages. Um, and this was in the, still in the 1800s, where, before you would think the divorce would be common, but that, that you could see who was divorced and then who they had remarried at the, the same time. <laughs> so there was a, certainly a bit of an imperative to, uh, for many people to find a mate, both men and women, for a number of, of reasons. Uh, but. Um, and there was one woman that lost both her former husband and her current husband in the Alamo among the Gonzales widows. Um, and that was very interesting, too. Uh, but, but one woman who did return to Gonzales, her, one of her descendants reported that the woman w was just happy to find that one of her hens had survived the carnage because everything was was torn up, and was sitting on a nest full of fertile eggs. So that gave her happiness. And, and I, you know, I expect this is true, and, and, and I'm sure she was. <laughs> but if the creaking wagon wheels haunted Noah Smithwick, how much more might they have continued to haunt the woman in the wagon, and her children for that matter? Dilu Rose Harris's mother had spent hours on a ferry on a swollen Trinity River with her children, including a sick daughter who was, went into convulsions on the ferry and soon died on the journey. Did Dilu Rose Harris's mother cringe at water crossings or even at placid river scenes for the rest of her life? It's appropriate to think of these women in terms of fortitude, resourcefulness, perseverance, but they had a lot of responsibility without much or any power or autonomy or great mobility. And I think it's important to remember that memories can haunt whatever the course of one's life afterward. I was thinking about this. Um, last time my husband and I came to Houston, I won't go into great detail, but um, it was a bad trip back. Uh, we wound up in an emergency room in Houston um, on a weekend, and then in, in thunderstorms and in a driving rainstorm outside LaGrange, uh, 
two dogs had wandered onto the road and the car in front of us stopped very quickly and I had to maneuver, I was driving, and I had to maneuver off the road. And uh, when we passed that spot yesterday coming down here, I just had this, <laughs> uh, and, and I, it made me think about these women and the things that, that were part of their, their mental and psychological landscape. Again, you know, whatever happened afterwards. And I'm sure some of them could take great pride in coming back and helping build the republic and later the state. But we do not want to lose the fact that they, for a time, were displaced persons. Thank you. I'll make this very brief. Um, I didn't come to Texas a whole lot in the 1970s and 80s. I made exactly two meetings of the TSHA during those decades, but I started coming a lot uh, as I started dipping deeply into Texas in the 1990s. And at the first meeting at the Renaissance Hotel in Austin, I saw these three people all hugging each other back when that was politically correct. One was this guy, Frank Delatea. The other was the late, great Jack Jackson, one of the greatest historians, really, and, and least appreciated in some ways of all the Texas historians who's no longer with us. And the third person was this lady, uh, Ana Carolina castillo Crim. And I thought, well, this looks like a friendly group, uh, not just uh, these three, and, but the whole TSHA. I've been to a lot of conferences in my time the Southern Historical Association, the American Historical Association, the Organization of American Historians, the Western History Conferences, there are none of them as good as TSHA meetings. Seriously, it's a great organization. And um, Carolina will not, uh, Carolina will not uh, brag on herself, even if she brags on me, but her work on the De Leon family of Victoria and that wonderful uh, colony of the Mexican uh, empresario, uh, Martin de Leon. It's just a great book to get you into what I was speaking about before, and that is the real life of these people and what they went through day after day, year after year. And she also never ignores the women Women of grit, women of courage, I see here in front of me, surviving the Anglo onslaught, and it was. I'll just say very briefly that a paragraph I wrote not too long ago said that Houston's biggest problem when he became president of the Texas Republic was not the Mexican army. It was the Texas army. It was out of control, and it was in Victoria, and they were not fair as our president might say today. They treated them very unfairly. And Carolina will tell you about that. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's frustrating not to be able to move around, but when we've got cameras and when we've got microphones, oh well. I bring you greetings from the far north. We had to come through, and I'm sorry we dragged the storm with us. So stay inside because it's going to be stormy outside. You don't want to be outside today. But what I wanted to share with you today, and that's one of the things that I began to look at, is the problems that the Tejana women were looking at. And that's the wonderful thing about Paula. She does such a beautiful job of looking at the Anglo women. But I think frequently we need to remember that it was the Tejanas who also had to face these onslaughts. Certainly when we look at the Anglo women pioneers, we do talk about the fact that they had wagons, uh, that they had wagons with screaming wheels. Uh, I don't know whether it's true that the Mexicans that greased the wheels of the wagons were called greasers. I don't know whether that's apocryphal. But whatever the case may be, the Anglos were the ones that used wagons. It was not the Tejanas. The Tejanas, when we're looking at, at women's rights, the Tejanas, unlike the Anglo women who did not have control of their property, it was the Tejanas who had tremendous control 
of their own situation. They could sue and be sued. They could own property. They could own cattle. They could buy and sell. They had brands of their own. When they married, their dowry that they brought into the marriage was theirs. And they could get it back before the kids got their inheritance. So when a husband died, the Tejana women still had tremendous amounts of control. And this is something that all of us thank you very much, my ladies, we can thank the Tejanas and the Hispanic culture for our power today. Because it is that culture that gave us women the right to own property. It was not the Anglo culture, which took rights away from women when they married. You had to have a husband or a brother or an uncle or a cousin or somebody that would stand up for you in court. Not so the Tejanas. The Tejanas actually sued, and as we're going to see, one of them very definitely used her power to gain control. And so what I want to do today is to look at the different, there are four different women that I want to look at. The first one is Trinidad Lozano. Some of you may be familiar with Estela Cermeño. She is a descendant of Trinidad Lozano. And another one, of course, is the one that I have written most about is Patricia de la Garza de Leon. She is going to drop to a second place in this case. Another one is going to be Facunda Cavazos Castillo. Notice the Castillo. Yes, she is one of my ancestors. And then, of course, the one that I also write about is Petra Vela, the wife of Mifflin Kennedy. And so when we look at these women, we have to look at the different areas in which they were located. Um, should we turn the light? Can people see the? It's fine. You can see it? OK. All right. So certainly Patricia de la Garza in Victoria, certainly in the Goliad area, Trinidad Lozano, in the Refugio area, this is where Facunda Cavazos Castillo lived, and Petra Vela down in the Corpus Christi area. So this is when Frank told me that I had to do the Goliad region, it is the whole region. Because these are women who come from an area that was Hispanic. There, there is no question. When we look at the Anglo women, they are most of them up in this area to the north. And so San Antonio to Flores to Edna all the way to Port Lavaca. This is Hispanic territory down here. So we're looking at women who had survived in the Hispanic world for, during, for all of this time. Now certainly remember that the presidios that had been established at Goliad, the presidio at San Antonio, and the presidio at Los Adais, these are areas where the women had to make a living because they were the wives of the soldiers. And some of them were, all right, ladies of the night, shall we say. But certainly they were women who had to live near the presidios. And so usually, especially as you'll see in at Los Adais or at Goliad, they had a little town. They had family huts, if you will, around the, the fort. They were not allowed to live in the fort. The soldiers lived in the fort. But the women themselves lived in those little jacales outside the presidio. But in San Antonio, of course, they get fancy. They get fancy. They have the La Villita. And so this little villita, uh, one of the things that I do is I, I speak to the road scholars in San Antonio. And they get to go to La Villita and actually see the, the homes of the women. And I said, remember, this is not how all the women lived. This is how the women in San Antonio lived. But when you look at the women on the ranches, then we're talking about this is how they lived. So yes, they had waddle and daub huts when they first started. So when you have ranches, you're talking about women who are going to live very close to nature. They are going to have to survive with mud on their roofs when they first began. They are going to have to survive. And remember, when you're talking about South Texas, that's one of the things I love about um, the reconstruction up at, uh, when we look at, at the northern missions as, as they reconstruct them. They, you know, make them out of beautiful log cabins and everything. I'm sorry, there aren't any log cabins in South Texas because there weren't any logs. So the only thing you had is sticks. So how do you make sticks into a house? 
You do it with just exactly this. You put sticks into the ground and then you put little barriers on either side. You can see the little sticks across here and here. And then you put all of the sticks in between and then you cover them in mud. And so it does make a very effective house. Admittedly, when it rains, it may wash some of the mud away, but that the reason, of course, for whitewash. Because you do whitewash the outsides of these buildings, and when you whitewash the outsides of the buildings, it makes them relatively permanent. But the nice thing is, if it gets blown away by a hurricane, you just gather some more sticks and put it back together. So it's not a big deal to have these homes out on the ranches. And yes, certainly jacales with whitewash would be nice, and certainly this from La Villita is the kind of lifestyle that the women at La Villita would have lived, but sharing is one of the things that we find among the Tejanas. This is something that, yes, you lived on your ranch, but when you lived on your ranch, you could also sell to the Presidio. And so when you sold to the Presidio, you had your goods. Now, admittedly, this is modern day Mexico, so it's not quite the same thing. But at least it gives you the idea of what market day might have been like. And so one of the things that we have to remember is that at the Presidio is the captain. And the captain, that's one of the things I loved about reading the, the Bayer archives, is that they give you lists of what the captain's commissary consisted of. And yes, certainly it consisted of stuff that the soldiers could buy and that later was actually a, given to the, to the soldiers. But in addition, you find lists of ribbons and lace, gold ribbons, gold lace, satin, parasols, all sorts of wonderful things. And who was this for? It was for you all, my ladies, because you, my ladies, were the ones who were tempted. And considering the fact that your husband is just going to put it on his IOU, it's like having a credit card. <laughs> so did you go and shop at the commissary? Oh, heck yes, you did. And is it also why you ran illegal contraband to New Orleans, because remember, you were not supposed to trade with New Orleans. The merchants in Mexico City wanted you to buy from Veracruz, from Mexico City, all the way up to Texas. And so in this case, when you have a commissary who is charging an arm and a leg for the satins and the r laces and the, the umbrellas and the parasols, and your husband can sneak over to New Orleans or Los Adais, across the river to, Na to Natchitoches, and you could suddenly wind up with a beautiful gold mantilla for church the next Sunday, and somebody's gonna start wondering where you got it, and why can't I have one, and dear, you know, I want one of those. And when mama ain't happy, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> And so, of course, the ones who have, in this case, the presidial captains who have all of this commissary goods are the ones who are, of course, going to be happy to sell to all of you, my ladies, who are, we're going to have the rich over here on this side, we're going to have the middle classes over there, we're going to have the poor. Sorry, y'all are the poor over there. So in this case, think about it. How on earth is the captain going to sell all of these goods? What he does is he has raffles. And so all of the soldiers are required to buy a ticket to the raffle. So you could buy a one peso ticket or a two peso ticket. And sure enough, what you have in the, in the Bayer archives is suddenly one soldier is blessed with 40 pairs of red shoes, red high heeled shoes. So suddenly he is going to become very popular with all of the wives of his fellow soldiers. So can he sell them? Maybe, but at least he can maybe give them away. So this is one of the problems with being a soldier. The captain was going to make sure that he got rid of all of those wonderful, wonderful things on his commissary list. One peso for 24 pairs of shoes. What you're going to do with them is your problem. Now, one of the things that we also look at is godparenthood. You all, my ladies, the one thing that you wanted above all else was to find good godparent, godchildren. 
sorry, godparents for your children. You had to have godparents not only for the baptisms, but you had to have godparents for the marriages. You had to have godparents for the grandkids. So godparenthood and the connections between godparent, godparenthood is why even today, right now today, oh my God, I did a presentation down in, in Laredo on Petra Vela, and I was suggesting that Petra Vela's children were, Vidal children were all, oh my God, illegitimate. And uh, one of the gentlemen in the audience was from Mexico, and he didn't understand English, but he heard, literally, the dead silence after I said that all the Vidal children were illegitimate. He said, you could have heard a pin drop, and he knew that I had said something scandalous. And yes, I did. I absolutely did. However, however, the Vidal children still have gone on to become godparents to half a dozen different people. And so when you go to the border, or actually when you go into South Texas, anything south of Houston, todos somos primos. And it's true. It is absolutely true. We are all cousins, perhaps not blood cousins, but certainly cousins by godparenthood. So godparenthood becomes a tremendous, tremendous tie for the Tejanas. Now think about our poor little Anglo women. The poor little Anglo women up in the colonies of Belleville and San Felipe and all these other Anglo colonies, these Anglo women, they could be friends with each other, but did they have the religious requirement that you take care of your, grand, your godchildren? They didn't have that. They didn't have that connection. The Tejanas do. The Tejanas are able to call on their godparents. And certainly Patricia de la Garza, as we're going to see, is one of the examples. And so when we talk about the lifestyle of these Tejana women. We are talking about a ranch culture. We are talking about ranches. These are not women who live in the towns. They are not the women whom we see around the presidios. They had been at one time, but now they begin as, as the Indian threat is moved farther and farther north as, well, frankly, they invited the Anglos in so that, thank you very much, you all could be the front line to defend us against the Indians. That was a good thing for the Anglos to do. They were the blood and guts that were going to be spilled up north so that the Tejanas could be safe. But in this case, ranch living means now that you're going to be able to have a casa de sillar. Oh my gosh. And once again, Mama is now very happy because she doesn't have to have that jacal that is made out of stones or out of sticks sticks and stones. So in this case, now finally she actually has a house that has a decent roof. And also they begin, now certainly one of the things that, that Frank has always, excuse me, Dr. De La Teja has always argued, is that the northern frontier was not wealthy. They were not well to do. How did they make money? These were not people who had thousands and thousands of head of sheep that could be taken to Mexico City to make huge amounts of money off of. They were not gold miners. They were not silver miners. These were people who had hides and tallow. Because you cannot ship cattle long distances, except, wait a minute, 1778, we have Bernardo de Galvez. 10 minutes left, oh shoot, okay. We're gonna talk very fast. So in this case, hides and tallow was the way that you made money. The first cattle drive that was actually to Bernardo de Galvez, the Louisiana governor during the American Revolution to supply his troops that he was fighting the British. And Bernardo de Galvez is able to use Texas cattle. But the vaquero ranching culture is what these Tejana women are used to. This is how they live. This is what they are used to. Now, I would like to mention the fact that no, the Tejana women did not use wagons. Why? Because there aren't very many good wagon roads. What they used was horses. And there is nothing more obvious than if you can see women using side saddles even today in the charriadas, in the, these cowboy gatherings of Tejanos, you will see women with gorgeous white 
uh, skirts, you know, and, and Mexican hats, and, and I should have gotten some pictures of those. But in this case, those Tejanas are the ones who used to ride side saddle, and it didn't make any difference how far you had to go. You were riding horseback. No wagons. You didn't worry about wagons. Remember, 80% of all goods were carried by mule. And so in this case, you rode horses. Now, as far as Mexican independence is concerned, remember what has just happened to you all, my ladies. In 1813, what has just happened? You have had the Mexican independence movement in Mexico in 1810 under Father Hidalgo has now spread to San Antonio. And in San Antonio, suddenly you've got your liberals. No, excuse me, y'all are the rich. Y'all are not the liberals. My liberals, probably the poor over there on that side. My liberals, the poor, are going to be the ones who are going to revolt. And when you revolted in 1813, guess what? My conservatives over here, they were the ones that sent General Joaquin de Arredondo. And what did they do to you? Y'all were massacred at the Battle of Medina. Massacred at the Battle of Medina. And then on top of that, they, he came into San Antonio with his lieutenant, mind you, Santa Ana. Absolutely. The young lieutenant Santa Ana comes with Joaquin de Arredondo. And you women were locked into warehouses where you could hear the bullets outside as they shot your sons and your fathers and your uncles and your husbands. You tell me that didn't hurt. So by the time Mexican independence comes along, yes, you all were willing to revolt. But what are you learning from the Battle of Medina? You learn to keep your heads down and your mouth shut and don't talk politics because it's dangerous. Of course, it's true today, too. But anyway, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but Anglo arrivals, now, my Tejanas, you all have to face the fact of what are we going to do with these Anglos? Yes, they're out there to defend you against the Indians. But are they going to be looking at your land? No, the land of, that we're talking about, the Refugio and Goliad and, and Victoria, it is actually going to be the ranches that you all have in the south that you're going to hang on to. But those empresario colonies, remember, when Stephen F. Austin is offering nearly 5,000 acres, 4,428 plus the 177 acres, is it any wonder that 30,000 Anglos were riding GTT on their cabin doors and pouring across the river to come into Texas? Some of them illegally. The first illegal aliens were actually the Anglos. But now we have to look at the women themselves. Trinidad Lozano is a descendant of one of the soldiers of Goliad, and I'm not going to go into, since I obviously don't have very much time, I have five minutes. These earliest families, it was actually her, her um, father who squired Austin around Texas and showed him where his grant was from the Colorado to the Brazos River and told him, no, you cannot sell the land. You have to give the land to your settlers. And Stephen Austin is tearing his hair out saying, no, 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 I've got to be able to sell land. I've got to make money. No, the land belongs to the king. And after the king, the land belongs to the Mexican government. And that land is to be given, given to the people. Now, Trinidad Lozano, does she already have a ranch? Yes, she does. Yes, she does. But the impact of the empresarios is now suddenly, and certainly when we look at the areas, this area in particular is where Austin's colony is going to begin to impact on you all, my Tejanas. And Patricia de la Garza, now remember I told you about your godfather? 9,000 pesos. And when I started doing the, the research on, on dowries in Monterey, the biggest dowry in Monterey was 5,000 pesos. She got 9,000. So was she of the rich? Absolutely. Absolutely. She is one of the wealthy. And she took her money and gave it to Martin. Does she get it back after he dies? You bet she did. This was a woman who knew how to hang on to her money. And certainly it was with Martin that they found Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe Victoria. Unlike the other women that we've looked at, she was the wife of an empresario. Now, granted, it was a very small colony, 
The De Leon colony is small, and he constantly, constantly got into trouble with DeWitt because DeWitt's people were coming across the De Leon colony, and DeWitt being, sorry, I apologize to the DeWitt descendants, he was a drunk. Of course, many of them were, so was, Stephen, so was Sam Houston. But <laughs> Margaret cured him, Margaret cured him. So in this case, De Leon is going to actually be one of the impresarios. So is he important? Yes. Was he a cranky, nasty old son of a gun? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And so did he get crossways with DeWitt? Yes, he did. But conflicting land grants, this is now the problem because these grants are so huge that yes, when you have a grant for a Carlos de la Garza on the San Antonio River and you have a grant for a Trinidad Lozano on the or one of the De Leon families on the, on the Guadalupe, yes, they are going to cross. And so this is going to become a problem. Now, we don't have time to go into Hayden Edwards and the problems, but finally they closed the borders in 18, April 6th, 1830. And it is Santa Ana who opens the borders in 1832. And now suddenly, during that time, to avoid having Anglos coming in, who Mieriteran had said were they weren't learning Spanish and they weren't Catholics. Of course, the only Catholic priest that you had other than San Antonio was the drunken Muldoon. Everybody liked liquor. It was good for them. But in this case, who are they going to invite? They're going to invite Irish Catholics. And the Irish, excuse me, the Irish Catholics are going to come in to Refugio and they're going to come in to San Patricio. So these are the areas. So Facunda Cavazos, who is going to be in this area down here, she is going to be one of the ones who is impacted by these Irish settlers. And actually, Facunda Cavazos, because of Jose Maria, Cavaz uh, Jose Maria Castillo, is actually going to get a land grant from Power and Hewitson. Now, were they wealthy? No, they absolutely were not. All of us that, that are you know, Tejano descendants, we like to think that we're, oh, we're so important and we're, we're from the, the higher classes. No. No, sorry. Facunda Cavazos was not wealthy. And once again, you have the difficulty with how are you going to make money? Now, certainly the Texas Revolution is going to impact all these women. It's going to impact the empresarios. It's going to impact uh, Patricia de la Garza. And what she does is to insist. Now, remember, she's of the wealthy, my wealthy over here. And so she is going to insist that they go to New Orleans. She demanded that her family be moved to New Orleans, and they did. And she lived in New Orleans for most of the, most of the period of the Republic of Texas. Now, Facunda Cavazos is going to be one of the ones who stays and gets the grant from Power and Hewitson, and Trinidad Lozano is going to be one of the ones that stays and keeps her head down and her mouth shut because that's what you learn to do. During the Republic of Texas, remember it was a very difficult time, very difficult time for everybody. It was hard because there wasn't any way to make money. The government tried to tax, and in taxing, they took land away from many of the, of the Tejanos because the Tejanos couldn't pay for the land. However, certainly when we look at the De Leon family, Fernando De Leon, the eldest son, had over 100,000 acres in his own name at the end of the Texas Revolution. By the time they returned in 1845, Patricia de la Garza says, we are going to fight for our land. Now, did Fernando lose land? Yes, he lost about 50,000 acres. Much of it was not his. He had kept it for other Tejanos. And in this case, Patricia de la Garza insists that her daughters and granddaughters fight for their land in court. Did they have to pay the lawyers land? Absolutely, they would pay them a league and a labor or a, however much the lawyer demanded. But in this case, did it work? Yes, it did. To this day, Mission Valley is still in De Leon hands today. So the De Leon family does succeed in fighting back. They did win their court cases. So this is one of the things that is, shows the power of the Hispanic women. Now, certainly because she was well-to-do, that was one of the reasons that she did win. But in this case, that Mission Valley Ranch today, if you go up there, 
Not all of it is in De Leon hands, but are there still De Leon descendants? Absolutely, through Felix. Hundreds, hundreds of them. Now, the Civil War, is this going to have an impact on the Tejana women? You know what the Tejana women told their husbands? You'll do the militia right here. There was only one of the De Leon children who actually went and fought, and he came back a gambler and a drunk, and his cousins, Matiana Benavides and the other women, actually took his land. They let him keep the ranch just around the house itself. The rest of it, because he refused to repay the money they had loaned him, they took his ranch. So were the women tough? You bet they were. Now, Facunda Cavazos had been married. She had children already. She marries for the second time, marries Jose Castillo, and with these two new sons that she has, she has settled in the Power and Hewitson colony, and unhappily, she gets crossways with, well, she didn't, her sons did. Uh, Jose Maria Castillo had, had, had allowed the welders to run cattle across their land to the river, and the welders then claimed the right to that land. And when one of the Castillo sons finds out that the court has ruled in favor of the welders and the Castillos have lost most of their land, he gets into an altercation with Tom Welder and Severo Castillo shot Tom Welder. Of course, Facunda tells the boys, run for the border because the lynch mobs are after you. This is during the 1870s. So the 1870s is a period when there is a tremendous amount of antagonism. Yes? Uh, actually, it was John Welder who was shot. He was like great-grandfather. Oh, there you go. See there? There you go. How wonderful. I thought it was his son, Tom. Who was, who was shot? Well, thank you, okay, good to know. So in this case, the two boys, because the Germans are with the Anglos, uh, the two boys have to make a run for the border, and uh, once they reach the border, they actually established a ranch at Charco Escondido, which is still there today, except that once they got across the border, it is Facunda Cavazos who decides that she is going to move the whole ranch. So she takes the cattle, all the cattle, she takes her cowboys, and she moves the ranch south of the border to Charco Escondido. So she didn't fight for the land, she had lost in court, so she simply creates another ranch in Mexico. And so that ranch, that settlement at Charco Escondido, Estela says that her grandmother used to go down to Charco Escondido and see the ranch and see the wealth that she thought the Castillos had by this time. In comparison to Mexico, perhaps they were. They hadn't been here, but they certainly were down there. That cattle in Charco Escondido provided a living, a very substantial living for the Castillos. Unhappily, the welders did hire a Mexican colonel to shoot the two welder, the two boys, Severo and, and Manuel, and the two boys were found floating in the Rio Grande. And uh, my grandfather, just to finish the story, my grandfather did eventually, when he was 15 years old, he got his gun and his horse, and he rode into a bar in Monterey and shot the colonel who had killed his father and his uncle. So <laughs> they, they get back, they get back. <laughs> now, Petra Vela, certainly we're familiar with Petra Vela because she was eventually married to um, Luis Vidal. No, she wasn't. According to the, the tradition of the, the family, she supposedly married the lieutenant uh, who went on to become a great general? No, it turns out that she was actually listed in the census records as a sirvienta, a uh, maid. 
and uh, her children were hijos naturales. And when I found these records, of course, it scandalized the people in Laredo. But Luis Vidal, of course, had been born in Guadalajara. He had actually gone to Mar Mar uh, school in Mexico City. He had been posted at, at um, in South, South Mexico, and his second posting had been at Matamoros, and he was actually involved in the uh, capture or attempted capture of San Antonio. He dies in 1850, but I found in the records that he had been actually married not to poor Petra, but he had been married to Andre, Andra, Manuela Andrade y Castellanos, and her three sons are legitimized by the church. Petra, of course, has gone on to have dozens of kids and, uh, not dozens, I'm sorry, it was 10, <laughs> ten kids. And in 1850, she moves to Brownsville. She marries Mifflin Kennedy after she has already had one child. I mean, my God, it's her ninth kid. Eh, so what if it's illegitimate? But in this case, Mifflin Kennedy does make with all of these kids, he does not accept these kids into his home. When she goes on to have all those kids, her other children are disinherited because they are Mexican. She dies from cancer and her children are bought off for 5,000 pesos apiece at a time when Mifflin Kennedy was a multi-millionaire. So, Trinidad Lozano, she is also one of the ranch women, and because of the barbed wire and bullets that begin to come through her windows at night, she is forced to give up her land, and she sells out to the O'Connors. And uh, certainly there have been attempts to get the land back. Uh, it doesn't work, and she goes on to live with very little money in the barrios in San Antonio. So the women, Trinidad Lozano, she lost her land, but she stays in Texas. Patricia de la Garza de Leon kept her land, but she had to fight for it. Fagunda Cavazos Castillo loses her land, but she recreates a ranch in South Tex in Northern Mexico. Petra Vela, her children lose everything. So the women, these women, as they are in South Texas. Each of them had a different reaction to the Anglo onslaught. But did they succeed? Are their descendants still here today? Yes, they are. Thank you. Now, I am going to be uh, doing a tour, and this is one of the things that I'm, I'm going to steal all of Paula's ideas uh, for Gonzalez. We're going to be going to Sam Houston's, uh, we're going to follow in Sam Houston's footsteps, and we're going to Gonzalez. So I'm going to use all those stories about the runaway scrape, and we're going to be going back up through San Felipe and all those areas, and then we're going to be doing the Spanish mission. So if you want to follow in their footsteps, just go to historictoursoftexas.com, and we'll be doing it again. Okay, thank you. Any questions? No, 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 no. No questions. No questions. No. He's not going to let me do questions. questions okay. Questions later. Questions later. All right, we're out of here. Yeah. Now you get to hear boring reading. <laughs> no, Frank does a very good job of reading. He does. He does. I read good. He reads good. He does read good. Okay, there you go. Okay, well, uh, as I said earlier, Bruce Winders couldn't be with us, so I'm gonna be reading his paper. Uh, you will notice we're a little bit out of sync with the time, um, and, but it's okay, we're gonna, because the tour's off, we've decided we're moving the question and answer period after Mary Shear's talk, so we'll do it at the end of the day, that'll give you a chance uh, to gather your thoughts, uh, put all of this together, and uh, ask your questions at that time, and uh, we will do the best that we, uh, we can to, uh, to answer them. 
Uh, I do have to read this paper, and I only uh, got it this morning since Bruce wasn't able to join us. So uh, please bear with me as I, um, as I attempt to uh, run through it. Since I haven't been through it before, I don't know how long it, it uh, actually lasts, but I will, I will read as diligently as I can. Sister, do not be afraid, women of the Alamo. In September 1846, Lieutenant Jefferson Peake visited San Antonio to obtain supplies for his regiment. His regiment, the 1st Kentucky Cavalry, was just one of the units traveling to punish Mexico for, quote, shedding American blood on American soil. Upon arriving in town, Peake visited the ruins of the Alamo, the scene he noted where Crockett and Bowie had been murdered. He assumed the fort had been, quote, almost completely demolished in the battle, not knowing that most of the destruction had occurred when the Mexican army evacuated the town. After finishing his official business, Peake left San Antonio to rejoin his regiment. He rode southward 25 miles on the Goliad Road before stopping for the night at Cantonas, or the Calaveras Ranch. Peake noted in his diary, quote, here I stayed all night at the house of a doctor from Lexington, Kentucky. His wife was a Spanish woman who could speak English. Her husband was gone to the Rio Grande. This lady gave me full detail of the massacre of Colonels Crockett and Bowie. She was, a, uh, she was in the prison, that is the Alamo, with them during the siege, and Colonel Bowie married this lady's cousin whilst in the Alamo. Although Peake fails to give her name, this lady was Juana Gertrudis Navarro, the wife of Dr. Horace Alsbury and sister-in-law of James Bowie. Moreover, she was the niece of Jose Francisco Ruiz and cousin of Jose Antonio Navarro, both signers of the Texas Declaration of Independence. Juana, this well-connected Tejana, had survived the battle and lived to tell about it. Our traditional impression of warfare is that it is a masculine activity. Men go off to war to fight one another and women stay home to take care of their families. But what if home becomes the front line? That was the situation many women faced during the Texas Revolution. Towns became military prizes fought over by both sides. War, a human endeavor, always affects both the male and female of the species. Our modern notion of war, shaped by internationally agreed upon norms, is intended to shield civilians from the horrors of military conflicts. Following World War II, most of the Western world has been able to uphold the standard because they have used other means, such as diplomacy and mutual deterrence, to, serve, uh, to settle or stave off disputes. By contrast, however, modern conflicts occurring in less developed parts of the world far more resemble war as it existed throughout much of history. A fact that recently reinforced by images of the Balkans in the Middle East, of street fighting, displaced persons, and civilian casualties. While the concept of total war as a recent concept um, as a, yeah, as a recent, civilian populations have always been considered fair game throughout history. Civilians are pressed into military service, made to labor, and their bodies used to satisfy the carnal needs of soldiers of both sides. Their property is taken from them and, and or despoiled as both punishment and a cruel form of entertainment. Civilians are often pressured to supply information, intelligence, about their family, friends, and neighbors. In some, it is often as dangerous and unpleasant to be a civilian in a war zone as it is for the soldiers. This was the situation faced by the women who sought refuge inside the Alamo. Certainly the female Alamo survivor who has received the most attention has been Susanna Dickinson. In 1831, the 22-year-old native of Tennessee settled in Gonzales with her husband, Almiron. Almiron Dickinson had been one of the colonists involved in the skirmish over the Come and Take It cannon on October 2, 1835. Susanna remained at home with her 18-month-old daughter, Angelina, when her husband and other Texans marched off to capture San Antonio. In early November, 
A group of Aish Bayou volunteers ransacked Gonzalez when they passed through the town on their way to the front. Dr. Lancelot Smithers, one of the few male residents left in town, reported that the rowdy mob broke into houses and, quote, uh, robbed all they could lay their hands on. Shockingly, he said, that the Aish Bayou men, quote, treated the women of this place worse than all of the Comanche nation. For he further con con uh, he feather further contended that, quote, such insults will never, were never offered to American women. One of the problems of reading uh, early 19th century um, texts is that um, if you don't put it in modern English, you are reading very idiosyncratic writing. Uh, but I understand, and this may be apocryphal, that uh, this is in a, my own aside, that um, Andrew Jackson once said that he never trusted a man that couldn't spell the same word at least two different ways. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, such insults were never offered to American women. In a series of letters to General Stephen F. Austin informing him of the volunteers' outrageous behavior, Smithers revealed the news that Mrs. Dickinson had been driven from her home, telling the general that the distraught woman had, quote, called on me to go and stay in her house to protect her person and property. For his trouble, the doctor was dragged from bed and badly beaten. With the townspeople exposed to such danger, Susanna joined her husband in San Antonio once the Texans captured the town, which explains why a woman from Gonzales, 70 miles away, came to be at the Alamo. While staying at the house of political chief Ramon Musquiz, Mrs. Dickinson took in boarders and washed clothes to support her family. For the most part, though, the women of the Alamo were bejareñas. It would be incorrect to say that these other women of the Alamo are totally unknown, but their stories have only started to emerge in any meaningful way since the Texas sesquicentennial. Advances in the fields of Tejano and women's studies has forced the broadening of the Alamo story beyond Susanna Dickinson and her daughter Angelina. The inclusion of local women from Bejar not only tells us about them, it also informs and explains how the 1836 siege and battle were community events. The frontier community of San Antonio de Bejar knew war. Soldiers and civilians had lived side by side from its earliest days. Hardly a family could not recall a story of murder and captivity from decades of Indian raids on the town and nearby missions. In one such instance, Concepcion Lozoya, mother of Alamo defender Toribio Lozoya, had Jose Francisco Ruiz to thank for ransoming her son from the Comanche, who had taken him when he was a boy of six. Furthermore, the tumultuous years leading to Mexico's independence from Spain, which included three battles and nearly a year of martial law under the Spanish, were fresh on everyone's minds. Few would forget the sight of the decaying corpses of neighbors and relatives still laying out in the plaza seven months after General Joaquin de Redondo ordered their execution. The plight of Bejar's women locked in La Quinta to cook for, royal, for the Royalist Army and the outrages they suffered while imprisoned stood in stark warning about what can happen in an occupied city. War returned to San Antonio in the early days of the Texas Revolution. On October 12, 1835, General Austin and the Federal Army of Texas marched from Gonzales. The force was determined to occupy San Antonio, um, then held by centralist forces under Martin Perfecto de Cos. Perhaps Cos could be convinced to leave without a fight. More likely, though, the town would have to be starved into submission or carried by storm. Neither of the last two options boded well for the townspeople. The rebels occupied positions outside San Antonio throughout October and November. Although several victories were gained over Cosa's men, the Texans realized that they must drive out the Mexican forces if San Antonio was to be theirs. On December 5, a five-day long battle for Bejar commenced. From their position at the Alamo and around the, uh, the main plaza, Cosa's soldiers unleashed a deadly fusillade uh, on the Texans, advancing through the town. 
the rebels quickly realized that they must take shelter inside houses that lined the town streets. The attack, however, had begun early in the morning, giving the residents no time to evacuate. According to Dr. Joseph E. Field, the attackers were often, uh, often found the houses occupied by families. He related two accounts, quote, to show how the ladies fared during the prolonged fighting. In the first, he wrote, quote, the soldiers on forcibly entering the house in their ardor for getting at the enemy found a number of females who had been shut up for three days without sustenance. The doctor claimed the frightened women, quote, could not be quieted until each had received a kiss from a gallant soldiers into whose hands they had fallen. Some might question his representations of these women as damsels in distress in need of rescuing, but the incident illustrates the condition faced by townspeople trapped in the fighting. Field's second story demonstrates the risk taken by anyone leaving the protection of their houses during the battle. According to Field, a woman was fired upon by a whole platoon of Mexican soldiers when she ventured to the river to draw water for her family. She was struck five times and her bucket hit once. I don't know why that's important. But, um, <laughs> but she survived. Years after the battle, Juan, it must have been a really good bucket. Um, Juan Antonio Chavez, who was then a young boy in 1835, recalled that his family, quote, was compelled to flee from home and seek refuge in the country. He noted that upon returning after the battle, Quote, we found the house badly shattered with shot and shell. With numerous bullet holes marking the walls, Chavez stated, had our family remained, some, if not all, would have been killed. It was wartime experiences like these that prompted women to seek safety with their families inside the Alamo's walls upon the Mexican army's return to Bejar. Santa Ana's arrival was not unexpected. Blas Herrera, Placido Benavides, and other Tejanos had tracked the Mexican army's advance, relaying that information to their relatives and the Texans occupying the town and the Alamo. Learning of the Mexican army's approach, some, like Chavez's family, chose to retreat to the countryside as early as mid-February. Uh, J.M. Rodriguez, who was age six at the time, later recalled his family's departure after receiving a warning that Santa Ana supposedly had visited the town in disguise. Because his father was away serving with the rebels, Rodriguez stated, quote, my mother decided it was best for us to go into the country to avoid being here when Santa Ana's army should come in. We went to the ranch of Doña Santos Jimenez. The family buried about $800 inside their house, leaving Bejar in ox carts. The journey to the Jimenez Ranch took two days. Antonio Menchaca stated that James Bowie and Juan Seguin insisted that he and his family leave town because they, quote, would receive no good at Santa Ana's hands. Heeding the warning, the Menchacas headed for Seguin's ranch in mid-February. The Texans awoke the morning of February 23, 1836, to find townspeople hurriedly packing up or already on their way out of town. According to John Sutherland, who was there, quote, the citizens of every class were hurrying to and fro through the streets with obvious signs of excitement. Houses were being emptied and their contents out in, um, and their contents out in carts and hauled off. Much of the lower class, which had no better mode of conveyance, shouldered their effects and were leaving on foot. Colonel William B. Travis reportedly tried to stem the exodus, but to no avail. He and others ascribed their leaving to cowardice and disloyalty to the Texan cause, not seeming to realize that for local families, leaving town to escape the coming battle seemed the sensible course of action. Historian Andres Tijerina describes this exodus from San Antonio as the Tejano version of the better known Anglo runaway scrape. For, uh, for men tied to the Alamo who had no other place to go, it was time to look for this to, to the safety of their own families. Gregorio Esparza had planned on sending his family to Nacogdoches, but the wagons needed for the journey failed to arrive. 
John W. Smith, a family friend, warned Gregorio that anyone who was friends with the Americans should join them in the Alamo, since it was clear that the Tejanos supporting the revolt faced an uncertain future at the hands of the Mexican army. The Esparza family made several trips throughout the day, carrying blankets, chairs, and supplies from their house to the Alamo before finally settling into the church at twilight. It appears that several women had already entered the Alamo in the weeks or days prior to the Mexican army's return. Juana Navarro Alsbury and her 11-month-old son, Alejo, and her sister, Getrudis Navarro, had been brought into the fort under the protection of their brother-in-law, James Bui. Dr. Ellsbury had planned to take his family away and was looking for wagons when the Mexican army arrived. Enrique Esparza, who was then eight years old, later identified other women he saw inside the Alamo. These included Concepcion Lozoya, a mission descendant whose family home had uh, been at the southwest corner of the Alamo and had been transformed into a artillery platform. And she was there with her daughter, Juana, and two sons. Juana was the wife of Elio Melton, uh, an American and the garrison's quartermaster. Enrique remembered her because she was drawing circles in the dust on the ground with an umbrella, the first one he had ever seen. He also later recounted a woman named Victoriana de Salina and her three young daughters, and an old woman named Petra, perhaps Gonzalez. As for Andrea Castañón de Villanueva, later known as Madame Candelaria, Enrique said that he did not remember seeing her there, diplomatically adding, quote, she claimed to have been there, and I shall not dispute her word. Several female servants were also among the women of the Alamo. 27-year-old Trinidad Salcedo reportedly took, um, worked for either the Esparzas or the Beramendis. If employed by the latter, she would likely have come in with, the, with Navarro or Bui. Petra was also mentioned as a servant of the Esparzas. Bui owned a uh, slave woman named Betty. Another female woman of color was seen lying dead between two cannon on the morning of the final attack. Recent research indicates that this woman may have been Sarah, a slave whose master uh, in Kentucky claimed in a lawsuit that she had run off with Alamo garrison member Patrick Thomas Herndon. After the initial flurry of activity on the afternoon of February 23, women and children who had entered the Alamo settled down as best they could under the circumstance. The Dickinsons and Esparzas shared the sacristy located in the old church. Almiron and Gregorio worked the cannon mounted on the platform at the east end of the church, making it possible for them to spend time with their families. The Navarro sisters found quarters in the house located toward the north end of the west wall. She claimed that Boy stayed with them until he became too ill. As he was being taken away, the sick man reportedly told Juana, Sister, do not be afraid, promising Crockett, Travis, and friends would treat them kindly and see to their needs. Little evidence exists to tell where the other women were quartered. Um, the point to be made, though, is that the women occupied various places around the compound where they could be close to whoever had brought them into the fort and not all housed together in one location. The uncertainty of the situation caused concern. When would the Mexicans attack? Would help arrive in time? What happened if the fort fell? Nevertheless, the tension of waiting was broken by the needs to care for their families. Children had to be fed and watched over. Corn and beef had been brought into the compound the first day, so there was no reason to go hungry. Ana Esparza, had the foresight to bring in foodstuffs from home to augment what was available in the Alamo. Some women may have helped in the hospital, caring uh, the, for the wounded from the Battle of Bejar who were still recovering. Juana Alsbury apparently helped take care of Bui until he became too ill and had to be moved to private quarters in the low barracks. Comforting and being comforted by their families during the siege likely occupied much of their time. Susanna recalled she left the safety of the sacristy several times to visit her husband at his artillery post at the back of the church. 
These women had probably become accustomed to the sound of gunfire as the siege wore on. Cannonball striking the walls or ricocheting around the parade ground were a danger to be avoided by staying inside. In the midst of these dangers, though, family life went on. Susanna Dickinson reportedly later um, commented uh, or claimed that she and Almiron even had tea with James Butler Bonham on the night before the final attack. The morning of March 6th was a terrifying experience for these women. Darkness still enveloped the compound when the, when the attack commenced. The din of the battle was deafening. Men rushed by as they tried to reach their assigned posts in time to stave off the attack. Wounded men shrieked in pain as they stumbled across the compound. Uncertain of their own fate, the women prepared for the worst as soldiers began searching rooms for more rebels to kill. The acrid smell of sulfur from the clouds of gun smoke filling the air only added to the hellish atmosphere. Fortunately, for the sake of history, several survivors later recalled their experiences for officials and reporters. Both Susanna Dickinson and Enrique Esparza described the events that took place inside the sacristy where the two families stayed. According to Mrs. Dickinson, Almeron rushed into the room and exclaimed, Great God, Sue, the Mexicans are inside our walls. All is lost. If they spare you, save my child. They exchanged a final embrace before he hurried away to rejoin the fight. Confined to the sacristy, she claimed to have seen little of what occurred outside her room. However, she recalled towards the end, of, uh, toward the end several men who had worked the cannon with her husband rushed into the room pursued by Mexican soldiers. At least one man was killed in front of her as his body was lifted into the air on the soldiers' bayonets. Young Esparza's recollections were similar as he claimed, quote, I hid with other frightened children and their mothers. Some of Santa Ana's men shot into the room. One boy was killed, but the rest of us escaped, realizing that there were women and children in the room. My mother clasped her babe to her breast and closed her eyes. She expected they would kill her and the baby and me and my brothers. He later recalled, we could see little in the dark corner where we had huddled. Across the compound in a room uh, along the west wall were Juana Alsbury, her toddler Alejo, and sister Gertrudis. Their story mirrors that told by Susana and Enrique. Juana later related that uh, she could hear the noise of the conflict, the roar of the artillery, the rattle of small arms, and the shouts of the combatants, the groans of the dying, and the moans of the wounded. They witnessed little of the fighting in the compound. Juana asked her sister to go to the door to ask the Mexican soldiers not to fire into the room since it was occupied by women and children. She recalled her rude reception saying, Senorita Gertrudis opened the door. She was greeted in offensive language by the soldiers. Her shawl was torn from her shoulder and she rushed back into the room. As in the sacristy, the soldiers pursued at least one man inside the room, bayoneting him in front of Juana and her sister. Soldiers then, quote, broke open her truck and took her money, I guess that's trunk, and took her money and clothes, also taking the watches of Colonel Travis and other officers. As the fighting slackened, Mexican officers stepped into the lo uh, in, in to locate and save any non-combatants inside the Alamo. According to Susana, quote, a Mexican officer came into the room and addressing me in English asked, are you Mrs. Dickinson? I answered, yes. Then he said, if you wish to save your life, follow me. He led her out through the front of the church where she said she saw Crockett's body lying among the heaps and dying. Juana said that a Mexican officer entered her room and asked why she was there. Upon hearing her answer, he led her outside saying to her before he walked off that she should wait there until she and the other women could be sent to Santa Ana. Seeing her standing in the open though, another officer exclaimed, don't you see they are about to fire the, that cannon, leave. Confused and distraught, she heard a familiar voice calling to her. 
Juana's rescuer was Manuel Perez, the brother of her first husband and Alejo's hus uncle. She said that Don Manuel placed them in charge of a colored woman named Betty, belonging to Colonel Bowie, and the party reached the house of Don Angel Navarro, uh, her father, uh, in safety. Although no record exists of the experiences of other women on that morning, their tales likely would have been similar. Santa Ana's officers also attempted to locate any slave inside the Alamo. Joe recalled that, quote, the officers came around after the massacre and called out to know if there were any Negroes there. He then left the room along the west wall that had served as Travis's headquarters saying, yes, here is one. Um, it was he, uh, it was as he was being taken away that he saw the body of a woman of color lying between two cannons. Friends and family received the, re the survivors as they returned home. Ramon Musquiz and his wife took, su took in Susana Dickinson as Ana Esparza and their children. According to Enrique, his mother took supplies from the Musquiz store and cooked breakfast for everyone. Later that afternoon, the women who had survived the battle were taken to be interviewed by Santa Ana. Enrique recalled that Mrs. Dickinson appeared more excited than the other women. He also said that Mrs. Melton sent her brother, Juan Lozoya, to ask his mother not to mention that his sister was married to an American, a secret Ana Esparza kept to herself. After speaking to the women, Santa Ana gave each two Mexican pesos and a blanket and sent them on their way. Most returned to their own houses or stayed with relatives. Mrs. Dickinson, however, was allowed to return to Gonzales to carry news of the battle and deliver a warning to the rest of the Texans that uh, what the fate, um, what fate uh, awaited them unless they quit the rebellion. Susana's role as a messenger along with her status as a white woman explains why she became the best known of the Alamo women survivors. Life went on for the women who had survived the Battle of the Alamo. Susanna's life after the Alamo was well documented. Swept up in the runaway scrape, she and other Gonzalez widows stayed on the move for the rest of the revolution. Life on the frontier was hard for most single women, a fact that likely forced her into a succession of three bad marriages, John Williams, Francis Herring, and Peter Bellows. Her marriage to Herring ended when he died, but both Williams and Bellows sued Susanna for divorce. Her fifth and final marriage was in 1857 to Joseph William Hanning, with whom she was still living in Austin when she passed away in 1883. Her daughter, Angelina, mirrored her mother's life as she also married or cohabited with a series of men. She died in 1869 from a hemorrhage of the uterus at Galveston at age 37. Charges of prostitution had been leveled against both of the Alamo's messenger and its babe, during their lifetimes. Juana Alsbury reunited with her husband after the revolution. Dr. Alsbury, and interested in the quasi-military affairs between Texas and Mexico, often led him away from home. In addition, Alsbury had the misfortune to be carried away and imprisoned in Perote Castle following Wall's raid on San Antonio in 1841. As Jefferson Peake noted in his encounter with Juana, Dr. Alsbury had gone again to Mexico where a New Orleans newspaper reported the doctor was killed in September 1846. In 1857, Juana petitioned the state for financial assistance, saying that she was, quote, extremely poor without any means of sustenance. The following year, the legislature granted her a pension for life. Juana then recedes from public sight until her death in 1888. The rest of the Alamo's women had already dropped out of sight even before that time. Enrique Esparza became the voice of his mother, speaking for her and about her with reporters decades after the battle until his death in 1917, celebrated as the last survivor of the Alamo. Why weren't these women who witnessed such an important event not immediately sought out and made to tell their stories? News gathering, as we know it today, did not exist. Additionally, in the wake of the disaster, the Texans were concerned with their own survival and the survival of the Republic. 
Some of these women evidently were asked from time to time out of curiosity. Edward Stiff encountered Susanna while he was collecting information for his 1840 book, The Texas Emigrant. The author noted, quote, it was not, however, expected that she could detail very correctly every occurrence, and, feeling a, of, uh, and feelings of delicacy forbid me to inquire particularly respecting her treatment while prisoner in the Mexican camp. His statement reveals two concerns. She might not have uh, the, ca the capacity to be a good witness, and her reputation needed to be preserved. Nevertheless, heirs of the Alamo defenders relied on Susana and Juana to verify their claims that relatives had died at the Alamo. It appears that these women did not seek celebrity for their part in history, but wanted to get on with their lives. The, exception, uh, the exceptional one was Andrea Castañón Villanueva, better known as Madame Candelaria. Born in 1787, she was 51 years old at the battle. By the 1880s, she had made retelling her story into a cottage industry that supported her and her dog. Rip Ford and others and other prominent Texans believed her and arranged for the state to grant her a pension. Enrique Esparza and Juana Alsbury treated the question of her presence at the Alamo diplomatically, offering to take her at her word. Juana's statement that, quote, there were people in the Alamo I did not see echoes Enrique's previous remark about Madame Candelaria. If this is a vague description of the siege and the role of women in it, I don't, I don't think so. I think he does a pretty good job. Uh, it is because the sources we normally rely on do not exist. Few of the survivors were literate, and none we know of left written accounts. The, the accounts we have were mostly obtained through depositions taken by Texan officials to substantiate land claims and interviews conducted by reporters years after the event. These are not only often contradictory, but also show evidence of embellishment in the stories that are told and retold over and over. By the 1870s, it is unclear whose version of the battle you are actually reading, the participants or the scribes. Nevertheless, taken as a whole, these post-battle accounts have enabled us to capture a glimpse of women at the Alamo. Thank you. It was Jeff and the late Jan, Jan DeVault uh, that organized the first San Jacinto Symposium, browbeat some of us into speaking there, even though we said, I don't have time to do that. Um, it changed my life uh, for the better in so many ways uh, to be associated with the San Jacinto Symposium and to get to know these people and these wonderful folks, most of them right here in Houston, who year after year organized these San Jacinto Symposia and have now handed it off into the good hands of the Texas State Historical Association. Jeff Dunn is not like the guy on the old communist show, I Led Three Lives. He only lives and leads two lives. One is a very hardworking lawyer. I've seen him work on briefs until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning as I'm cursing him in the hotel room. Uh, <laughs> But he also works just as hard uh, in history. And just within the last week, he's answered a question that I had about what the heck happened to this obscure figure from the Texas Revolution. And believe me, if they have anything whatsoever to do with San Jacinto and the circumstances surrounding San Jacinto, Jeff Dunn will know. Um, he knows more about one particular woman from San Jacinto, Emily D. West, AKA the Yellow Rose of Texas, than any living person. 
uh, and he will tell you about her and about other women of the Texas Revolution. Today, I'm going to, uh, uh, he's going to tell you about a woman who, unlike Santa Ana, successfully attacked Sam Houston. <laughs> Please welcome Jeff Dunn. Okay, thank you, Jim. So I wasn't planning to talk about the law, but because Carolina brought up a very important point, I wanted to elaborate on that, and that is the distinction between Spanish civil law and English common law. So when the uh, Anglo-Americans came into Texas, the Spanish civil law was in effect, and uh, the distinction was largely based on the fact that Spanish civil law tended to protect families, whereas English common law, as adopted in America, tended to protect individual rights. And after the revolution, Texas had a great debate over which system of laws should govern uh, the republic and eventually the state, and this happened in 1840. And they could have easily have kept a, span a civil law system, Louisiana did, uh, but they ended up deciding to, to uh, select the English common law as adopted in America, but with so several significant exceptions uh, carried forward from the Spanish civil law, and that included such things as uh, rights to homestead, separate community rights, marital property rights, and uh, right of inheritance. And those are the things that Carolina talked about that were so significant in uh, creating uh, legal rights for married women in Texas that we didn't have in, in, in many other uh, Amer American states at that time. So now I'm gonna focus on San Jacinto. If, uh, if you were a Mexican soldier in Santa Ana's army on April 21, 1836, the only woman you would have seen in the distance coming toward you that day would have been uh, the female figure on this flag that you see on the screen, which is a figure of liberty. As far as it's known, there were no known women combatants in the uh, Texas Army and no known uh, support, supporting functions uh, roles in the Army either that day. Now the land on which the battle was fought uh, was owned by a woman, Margaret Peggy McCormick. Uh, she uh, came to Texas uh, with her husband, uh, Arthur McCormick, in 1824. He died soon afterwards, and uh, she owned this league of land uh, at the junction of Buffalo Bayou and the San Jacinto River. Uh, she uh, fled uh, her home just before the battle started, uh, and when she returned, found over 600 corpses on her land. Uh, neither the Texas or Mexican armies would remove them, so you can imagine the daunting task that she faced in uh, dealing with that problem. There were other women also that were impacted by the battle uh, who lived in the area. Uh, one was uh, Emily de Zavala, who came from New York and was with her husband, Lorenzo de Zavala, the vice president, lived directly across the bio from the battleground. A short distance away, the Texan president, uh, David G. Burnett, and his wife, Hannah Burnett, uh, also were impacted. Uh, both families were able to escape to Galveston. Uh, Mrs. Burnett uh, actually was uh, within firing distance of Mexican cavalry a few days before the battle. And the only reason that she wasn't fired at was because the Mexicans saw women in the boat as they were rowing off the shore. But she had to leave behind some of her fine dresses and Santa Ana was so impressed with them, he took them with him to San Jacinto, to the battleground, where they were promptly captured by the Texan army and then subsequently sold off, auctioned off to the soldiers as spoils of war, and she never got compensated for them. <laughs> now, we, we've heard today about Anglo-American women and, and the Tejana women, uh, but there also were women from Mexico who had no connection with Texas who were part of the Mexican army who were what were called camp followers. And there were quite a few of them uh, coming up through uh, Mexico. Uh, and we have documentation that about 10 of them were actually behind Mexican lines during the Battle of San Jacinto. Uh, George Hockley uh, reported that of the 730 uh, Mexican prisoners, uh, six of them were women. We also have uh, a record that one woman, one Mexican woman, actually was wounded in the thigh and managed to escape and make it back all the way to Feely Solo's lines on the Brazos River, which was quite impressive for that to have happened. 
And there's also accounts of, of at least one, maybe two women who were killed during the engagement. Uh, one of them uh, actually uh, resulted in a controversy many years later and a libel lawsuit over exactly what happened and who was responsible for that. And uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, there was one uh, female prisoner of the Mexican army that day, and that was this woman named Emily D. West, uh, who, uh, whose story is remarkable because uh, she is reputed to have been in Santa Ana's tent, distracting him at the precise moment that the Texans attacked the Mexicans and uh, it was, it, it, by at least one account, uh, uh, perhaps a, the, the victory may have been attributed to her participation uh, in, that, in that event. Uh, now, I've, I've talked about her before um, at the 2016 symposium. I gave an entire session on that, so I don't want to repeat that here. Uh, so instead, I'm going to talk about an incident that happened uh, a few days before the battle. Uh, and it was actually the last encounter between the Texas Army and a woman before the Texas Army got to the battleground. Uh, <clears throat> this incident happened in northwest Harris County, and it involved a very aggressive and feisty woman whose name was Pamelia Mann. Uh, now, but she was uh, actually commonly known and widely referred to, though, as Mrs. Mann. Uh, and the story relates to a yoke of oxen that she either loaned or was taken from her uh, by the army, uh, and then uh, she took it back a few days later. The story is interesting because it's one of the few instances where we have some accounts of an interaction between a woman and the Texas army, uh, somewhat contentious, uh, but it's also interesting because uh, the story has been used by some of the participants in the battle to try to illustrate what Sam Houston was thinking and where he was going. Um, and so to put this story into context, you have to consider the landscape of what is now the Houston urban area. So in 1836, there were very few people living in this part of Texas. In fact, it really was not even considered a, a significant concentration of population at that time. This map shows the important creeks, and uh, the red circles show the important settlements, which were very small, and the dotted, uh, brown dotted lines show the major arterial uh, roads that went through the area. So after the fall of the Alamo, Sam Houston took command of the Texas Army, moved the men eastward, eventually arriving at San Philippi on the Brazos, turned north, 18 miles north, camped uh, at uh, opposite Jared Grossi's plantation. And here the army uh, remained for two weeks with about 530 men. Meanwhile, Santa Ana follows behind. Uh, but instead of turning north to engage Houston, he turns south. And he crosses, uh, he gets to the Brazos River about where Richmond is today. It was about that time that Houston uh, learned uh, where Santa Ana was or where the Mexican army was was making decisions about what to do at that point. Uh, Santa Ana uh, realized that the Texan cabinet was at Harrisburg, which was a fairly short distance away, uh, completely unprotected by any kind of uh, military force. And so he set out with 750 men to, to capture the town, which he hoped would, at that point, seal the end of the revolution altogether. And before he did so, he, he reputedly sent a, uh, he, he had captured a Texan and sent him up to, uh, told him to go back to Sam Houston. And the story is that uh, he, wanted, he wanted Houston to know uh, that uh, he, Santa Ana, was uh, up there, that he knew that, that Houston was up there in the bushes. And as soon as he had whipped the land thieves down there out of the country, he would come up and smoke him out. That was, that was his story. So after Houston learned that he was no longer being chased, but now was in the position of having to chase Santa Ana, he ordered the army to cross the Brazos on April 13th. And on the opposite side, the army received two cannons that were afterwards known as the Twin Sisters. They were put on a wagon, but the men had trouble finding animals to pull the heavy load. And it was here that Houston procured a yoke of oxen from Mrs. Mann. That evening, the army reached 
the home of Charles Donahoe, which was at a major intersection. But which way would they go? They, if, they, if they continued north, they would go to Robbins Ferry on the Trinity River and up to Nacogdoches. If they took a right turn, they could move toward Harrisburg in the direction of where they believed Santa Ana was heading. Anson Jones said that when the Army was at Donahoe's, Houston was compelled by the unanimous sense of the entire Army to deflect from that road and go to Harrisburg. And some accounts say that Houston told men at, during that evening that he would take the Harrisburg Road the next day, but he was only doing so under orders from Thomas J. Rust, the Secretary of War, and that he was do, moving in that direction against his own better judgment. But Houston's versions of these events is quite different. He said nobody gave him orders, and that he was the one who gave the order to move to Harrisburg. And he described this route from Donahoe's to Harrisburg as a force march, a 55-mile force march over three days uh, with prairies of quagmire of mud. And he said there were no less than eight impediments in one day had to be overcome. He doesn't describe those eight impediments, but according to several accounts, one of them was Mrs. Mann. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, Pamelia Mann uh, came to Texas in 1834 with her third husband, Marshall Mann, and two children from previous marriages. They settled near San Filippi. Uh, she was an entrepreneur, and she ran a boarding house at uh, Washington on the Brazos during the convention. And like many other civilians, was uh, impacted by the runaway scrape. And it happened that uh, she was with a party of refugees on the night of April 15th on the north side of Spring Creek while the Texas Army was camped directly across the, uh, the creek at Samuel McCarley's home. So you see the map. The Texas Army is now moving toward Harrisburg. Uh, they camp at Samuel McCarley's house, and right across the creek is this runaway scrape camp. So as it happened, uh, the earliest published account of this encounter uh, between her and the Army appeared in this uh, notorious pamphlet which was published in 1837 called Houston Displayed or Who Won the Battle of San Jacinto by a farmer in the Army. Uh, this farmer was later revealed to be uh, Colonel Robert Coleman who was a veteran of the battle. Now the purpose of this pamphlet was to denigrate Sam Houston's conduct and to make it appear uh, that he was not the leader that he was uh, making himself out to be. And uh, one of the examples that was used to illustrate uh, that Houston really wanted to take that road to Nacogdoches uh, was the incident involving Mrs. Mann and her oxen. So the uh, pamphlet actually goes into two stories about her. The first is, uh, suggests that there may have been a, a prior relationship between the two uh, because they mention that uh, she was found in Sam Houston's tent at the camp opposite Gross Grossi's plantation before the army crossed the Brazos. Uh, Sam Houston was lying down with his head in her lap. She was combing his hair at the moment that the uh, survivors of Fannin's massacre came in and told him about the massacre uh, of Fannin's troops, uh, which uh, caused a, a consternation of him being quite frightened and her saying, gee, General, you almost maybe put this comb in your hair. You must be very frightened. And he said, why wouldn't I be frightened when I'm looking at my own destruction and my country's destruction uh, as a result of uh, you know, what, he, what he had just heard? <clears throat> so uh, at Donahoe's, the, the Army left that morning on the April 15th, clearly not taking uh, the Nacogdoches Road. And uh, Mrs. Mann's oxen were pulling that ammunition wagon uh, with, when the Army camped that night. So here, here's how the uh, account of Houston Display describes this encounter. Quote, after the Army continued its march by the Harrisburg Road, a lady who it appears had loaned to the Army a yoke of oxen which were used in one of the ammunition wagons, rode up and said to the General, you are not going that road, are you, General? I believe I am, replied he. Then give me my oxen, said the lady. Dear madam, said the general, they propel my ammunition wagon. I care not for that, said the lady. I loaned you the oxen to go to the Trinity, and as if you, you have changed your route, I shall take them. 
So saying, she jumped from her horse and with her own hands disengaged the oxen from the wagon. The general sent back and by some means procured another yoke. Thus we see one woman set at defiance the general and the whole Texan army and cause a delay while they were on a forced march. The next time we see this story in, in print comes in 1853 when a narrative of reminiscences by William B. DeWeese was published. He said that when the army was camped on Spring Creek, Houston sent him and a company of men across the creek to guard and escort the women and children on their way to the Trinity. And then he says, quote, but I must not forget to relate an anecdote concerning the bravery of one of our Texas women. A Mrs. Mann who was in our company had discovered that a yoke of her oxen had been taken to draw the cannons with a heroism which might have been commendable had the oxen been taken by the enemy. As soon as she discovered it, she took a pistol and riding up to the foremost officer ordered him to stop or she would shoot him through. He instantly ordered the enemy, Mrs. Mann, to halt, whereupon she entered her complaint. She then seeing her oxen rode into the midst of the army and ordered the wagoner to loosen her oxen or she would shoot him at the same time presenting her pistol and she was immediately obeyed and had the satisfaction of seeing her oxen once more at liberty. We next see this account in Nicholas Labadee's narrative of the campaign, which was published in the 1859 Texas Almanac. Now, Labadee was a merchant in Galveston. He was a surgeon in the Texas Army. He sold drugs, medicines, kind of a nice guy who, who happened to uh, prepare this wonderful account of his experiences during the campaign. Uh, the uh, article itself turned out to be fairly controversial for a number of reasons. Uh, but he included uh, a segment on Mrs. Mann and, his, and her oxen. And it's important to understand also that unlike the earlier accounts, this Texas Almanac was uh, widely distributed. It was uh, considered, uh, the Texas Almanac was to Texans in 1859 like the internet is to us today. It was chock full of information. And as you can see, they published 25,000 copies uh, the equivalent of that today, when you take the population of, of Texas, certainly the non-slave population of Texas in 1859, it was about 16% of the population, man, woman, and child would get a copy of the Almanac. The equivalent today would be that if you wanted to do the same number of copies of your first edition, you'd have to publish 4,395,000 copies of your book. Uh, so it's a very, very significant uh, publication, uh, and it got the story out to a lot of people. So he had a separate segment on her. Uh, he said that he did not actually uh, witness the event, but it was a matter of concern to him because his medicine cart was on that wagon. <clears throat> so he rode back uh, and saw her in the distance moving off. He goes up to the wagon master and says, how did this happen? Why, said the mag wagon master, she said she had loaned her oxen to General Houston to go as far as the ferry on the Trinity. But as the army had changed its course, she said she would be damned if the general should have her oxen any longer. But how, said I, could you give them up? Why, said he, she showed fight, and when I resisted, presented her pistol, and then I thought it was prudent to surrender. <laughs> and then he laughed and excused himself and said, well, she was a man after all. <laughs> In 1860, Robert Hancock Hunter, who was a veteran of the battle, wrote Reminiscences, and uh, although it wasn't published until 1936, uh, he also wrote a very colorful account of this incident. He said that when Mrs. Mann confronted Houston, uh, she said that he told that he, she, he, she confronted Houston and said he told her a damn lie, that you were going to Nacogdoches and I want my oxen back. Well, Mrs. Mann, said Houston, we cannot spare them. We cannot get our cannon along without them. She said, I don't care a damn for your cannon. I want my oxen. She jumped down from her horse and with a knife cut loose the oxen. Nobody said a word. She jumped on her horse and away she went with her oxen. Captain Rohr, the wagon master, got permission from Houston to take a few other men and go after her to get the oxen back. Houston warned him, she will fight. He said, damn her fighting. 
but he, re he returned at nine or 10 o'clock that night without the oxen and with a torn shirt. <laughs> and some of the boys said that Mrs. Mann tore the shirt because she needed it for baby rags. <laughs> We next see Stephen F. Sparks. Now, he, he was a private soldier in the Army who became famous because he managed to outlive almost all of his comrades and became a, a kind of a celebrity in his own right. He gave uh, newspaper interviews of the campaign in 1892 and another one in 1905, and his 1905 account uh, was largely uh, published by the Quarterly of the Texas State Historical Association in 1908. But he included a story about Mrs. Mann in those two interviews, but it did not get into the published account for some reason. Um, his is interesting because he gives a kind of description of her. He said, we had a yoke of oxen that was pressed by Mrs. Mann. She was a notable Amazon woman. <laughs> <laughs> so she said Mrs. Mann followed the overloaded wagons through the muddy prairie and order, ordered Houston to give up her yoke of oxen. Houston said, Madam, don't irritate me. And she replied, irritate the devil. I'm going to have my oxen and then drew a pistol, rode in front of the wagon and said, whoa. Houston ordered the driver to keep driving. Springing from her horse, she unhitched her oxen, drove them away in the presence of the whole army, and Sparks said the men called this Houston's defeat. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the published accounts of what happened, uh, and, uh, but like all historical events, things are never constant new information is uncovered. And uh, some years ago, uh, when I was rummaging through material at the DRT library, at that time at the Alamo, I found this very remarkable letter, which I don't think has ever, ever been published. Uh, it was written by a lady named uh, Sarah Smith Ayers Park. Uh, she wrote this letter in 1893 to her son concerning uh, her experiences during the runaway scrape when she was 14. And uh, she was the daughter of uh, David Ayers, who was an Austin colonist who settled in Washington County. And uh, this, is what, this is an excerpt from this letter. She said, we were always, uh, well, and, and incidentally, she mentions that uh, as they were moving down from Washington on the Brazos towards Spring Creek, they fell into this family of Mr. and Mrs. Mann. And so they were all together at the same time, right across Spring Creek, on the day that this event happened. And she said, we were always wondering where or how Mrs. Mann, that's what, that's what she called her, uh, obtained her knowledge of what had occurred or was to occur in military events. She told my father that General Houston would camp on the other side of the creek that night, but she would not tell how she obtained that knowledge. But she said it was necessary for her to go meet with General Houston. She left on horseback and did not return until sundown. We could hear the noise made by the hundreds of soldiers. When Mrs. Mann returned, she said that she had found and driven to the camp a yoke of her oxen that had strayed from her, that they were attached to an army wagon, that all she did was go to General Houston to make a complaint, receive an order from him for the delivery of the steers, as she called it, and they were given up to her. The animals were then hitched to her wagon and we started on our day's journey. We had not gone far when six rough looking men rode up with the paper ordering delivery of a yoke of oxen, said to have been taken by a misrepresentation. The first thing we knew, the steers were unhitched from Mrs. Mann's wagon and driven off by these soldiers. And just as they passed us, they were, they were overtaken by Mrs. Mann with a Spanish whip which she called a quirt. In hand, she ran between the soldiers and steers, striking one soldier and then another, and then lashing the steers, sent them full speed on the road, then drew a pistol and said she would shoot the first one that attempted to go after her. Uh, she kept the oxen and the soldiers returned to camp. We parted company with our friends and did not see them more. And that's the last she said about it. She underlines friends as if to say, what in the world did we really just witness right here? <laughs> uh, but what's interesting is that if she had the whip and was lashing these men, that may explain why Captain Rohrer's uh, shirt was torn. <laughs> so this ends the uh, known surviving accounts of uh, Mrs. Manor Oxen. 
At that point, the uh, Texas Army uh, continued eastward. Uh, there was another fork in the road at uh, Abraham Roberts' house. They took that to Harrisburg, across Buffalo Bio on the 19th, and, uh, and, and engaged at Santa Ana on the 21st. So you can see on this map the runaway scrape route uh, crossed uh, Spring Creek and took the Atascocita Road on uh, to the Trinity by way of Liberty. So the two armies uh, converged on uh, near Lynch's Ferry, which was the uh, point that both armies were heading toward, uh, arriving on, on April 20th. They were surrounded almost by three sides by, by water. Uh, and the next day, the Texans attacked and defeated the Mexican army. And shortly uh, within uh, the turmoil of the event, uh, there you see the flag, uh, uh, the uh, Mexican women were encountered, uh, and some of them were captured, some a few killed, uh, and that was the next time that the Texan army actually encountered any women. So after the battle, the town of Houston was established uh, and became the temporary capital of the Republic. Uh, Pamelia Mann uh, and her husband moved to Houston uh, she opened a boarding house and a livery stable. Her husband, Marshall Mann, became the doorkeeper to the Texas Congress. Uh, and, uh, but the following year, he died, and that's when more trouble started for her. Uh, she was involved in a number of uh, lawsuits. She filed seven lawsuits of her own and was a defendant in 11 lawsuits. She was also uh, held, uh, cited for contempt of court twice. Uh, she was indicted and convicted of forgery, and in those days, uh, the penalty was death, and the judge sentenced her to death by public hanging, and she was spared only because President Mirabeau Lamar gave her a pardon, and, it was a, and, and he was then later accused of maybe uh, uh, himself being compromised with her, his relationship with her that caused him to do that, but that's another story. Uh, and uh, she also uh, was indicted for fornication uh, to, with a man that she did eventually marry, uh, but he also had legal troubles of his own um, and was uh, in, accused of assaulting a free black woman in Houston. Um, and all of this uh, came to an end in 1840 when uh, her new husband died in September and then she died in November, both of them probably from uh, yellow fever. Uh, but it's interesting that she really had a strong entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, even though Texas economy was poor, uh, she managed to, they said that she managed to triple her net worth and died with an estate of $40,000, which is about $800,000 today. So she may have been uh, the richest uh, woman in Texas at the time. So today she is commemorated in a public mural. Uh, and if you drive down uh, State Road 225, you'll see these uh, oil tank artwork, and one of them depicts Mrs. Mann and her oxen. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> not many people know that as they're driving by very fast, but sure enough, that's one of them. It's an artist depiction of that. Uh, so it raises several questions. The whole story raises several questions. Was, was, was this whole incident really evidence that Sam Houston really did intend to go to Nacogdoches uh, having uh, apparently promised her that that's where he was going to take these uh, oxen, um, and then changed his mind as circumstances changed? Or was he forced to change his mind because of being compelled by the army? Um, or maybe none of the above. Maybe the accounts uh, are wrong. Uh, because one thing we do know is uh, Houston never really wrote about this incident. He never really said anything at all about her as far as I know about Mrs. Mann or, that, or what had happened, and we also don't have an account from Mrs. Mann about what happened. We have these other accounts uh, telling us uh, what other people thought, but not really her perspective. Um, so, um, it, but the one thing about this is that uh, it does give us uh, uh, an interesting insight of this uh, interaction between her and the Army and it came at a time, uh, really, when the Army could ill afford uh, this delay. And uh, it really was uh, fortuitous that it ended the way it did, because the, the incident could have turned pretty ugly. She could have shot somebody, uh, or it could have held up the Army. 
uh, and the Battle of San Jacinto may not have ever occurred. But as it turned out, uh, uh, the uh, Texas Army did manage to make it and win the battle, and uh, she did get her oxen back, and in the process, uh, she became a legend in her own time. And so with that, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so with that, it's, uh, it's time to uh, go over and have lunch. So it's directly across the hall. Um, and um, we are going to give you a few minutes to start eating. And so Mary, wherever you are, somewhere, Mary's here somewhere. Anyway, there she is. Uh, if Mary will go over, I'll we'll give her a chance to do a little eating before she makes her presentation. And then after the presentation, we're going to do some uh, special uh, announcements and presentations, commentary on what's been going on, and we will have our question and answer. So all our question and answer will take place after Mary has spoken. Thank you very much. See you across the hall.